It's time for the Daily Planet Podcast Show. So sit back, relax, and give us a go. Scott and Matt and maybe a guest. Undertaking an epic pod quest. We're gonna ramble on about the movies and books and television and directors and film festivals and this really long list of stuff that I know nothing about, but they gave it to me and they really wanted me to read through it. And that's all I can really say about it, but it's gonna be great. Show. Hello and welcome to the Daily Planet Podcast, your weekly podcast for all things movies, TV, books, and anything else we feel like talking about. My name is Scott Daly, Editor-in-Chief of DailyPlanetFilms.com, and I'm joined as always by my co-host and co-editor, Matt Freeman. Matt, how are you doing today? I'm doing great, Scott. Looking forward to talking about the Coen Brothers, which uh, I think both of us love. Yeah, I, I am really looking forward to this too. I do. I, I, the thing about the Coen brothers for me is I always forget how much I love them. And then I rewatch one of their movies or one of their new movies comes out and I'm reminded, holy crap, uh, I love these guys so much. They're so good at what they do. Yeah. It's, it's funny you mentioned that it, they never quite come onto my list of favorite directors. And I think it's maybe just a filing error in my brain that I see <laughs> because there's, there are two people, therefore they can't be my favorite director, if that makes sense. <laughs> yeah, um, but yeah, they, they've made a lot of my favorite movies. So yeah, yeah. Um, we are going to to just be talking about their comedy movies today. Um, the re- reason we're talking about them is because uh, Hail Caesar comes out tomorrow. The Coen Brothers' newest comedy, um, or I guess if you're listening to this, it's already out. Um, so we thought we would talk about some some Coen Brothers comedy movies. Um, we will probably one day have an entire separate discussion where we talk about their dramas because I have a lot of things I would love to talk about um, with No Country for Old Men, um, Inside Lewin Davis, which is one of my favorite movies and maybe my favorite of their movies. I don't know if, if you've seen that one. I think you have. No, I haven't actually. Oh. Yeah, so in, in this discussion, actually, we're going to be leaving out some of their comedies even because we just sort of had to pick a, a cross section of movies that we've both seen. Um, yeah, but, that's true. But that's okay. That's true. So I'm sure there's going to be a movie on this list that um, you would be mad at us for. You, the listener, would be mad at us for leaving off. But if we had picked that one and uh, left off uh, some of the ones that, that that we had picked this time around, you'd be yelling at us about that one too. So there's so many good Coen Brothers comedies that there's really not time to talk about them all in one podcast. So we're just talking about uh, our favorites, um, and, and I, th- I think some of the best ones too. But um, I think it's going to be a good conversation. I'm looking forward to it. All right. But first, let's talk about some news, because we haven't really done any news in a while. So there's some exciting things that have happened in the past couple weeks that I wanted to get your opinion on. Um, The first one is um, there was there was a quote that came out about the the Batman in the new Batman versus Superman movie, um, claiming that he is going to be uh, much more of a, a rogue character. And the exact quote was he was going to be judge, jury, and executioner, um, which taken for the literal meaning means that this Batman is just going to straight up murder people. Um, what What do you think about that? Yeah, I mean... I'm not sure if the quote is supposed to be taken literally, but but if it is, it's a little weird because it's like, why not just use the Punisher or, you know, uh, I, I guess the reason not to use the Punisher is that you have to use Batman for it to be the Batman versus Superman movie. Yeah. Um, yeah. I mean, this, it, if it is true, it just seems like another indication that, that the DC in particular is just doing whatever they want with the characters to to fit their story, um, which they've sort of been doing for a while now. Yeah. And it's, I mean, I think whether or not the quote is, is supposed to be taken literally or not, we've seen in the trailer that this Batman, um, brands people with the bat symbol after he's, uh, confronted them. So regardless, we're going to be seeing a much more violent Batman. Um, it, it's weird to me only in the, the sense that the movie seems to be setting up, um, a kind of thing where we kind of understand both Batman and Superman and their concerns with the other person and being like super violent, kind of psycho crazy Batman, I think <laughs> makes you kind of side more with Superman who says, um, we need to just get this guy out of here. 
<laughs> so um, it, it, it's 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 weird. But then, so then I was thinking about it, and the Tim Burton Batman totally killed people. He killed tons of people. It was, it's hilarious, <laughs> yeah. especially if you watch the second the second Tim Burton Batman movie. I yeah. was I was like shocked when I rewatched it recently. He just kills everyone. Like, he doesn't even try to capture people. Yeah, there's that one scene where he, like, takes a bomb and, like, attaches it to a guy and then throws him down a manhole and we see the thing explode. Yeah. Um, that dude's definitely dead. Yeah, so, he, yeah it's like with one-liners, too. It's, it's yeah. really, really weird. So I was thinking about that and I was thinking about, you know, why that didn't seem to bother anyone back in the day and now this thing about... Uh, Batman potentially killing people in this movie has people kind of up in arms. And the, the conclusion that I came to, and I, and I don't know if, if you'll agree with me or not, but back then, like, first of all, the tone in that movie, in the deaths was much more kitty and like non-serious. And like, like I could almost believe that we would see that guy that exploded again, just with like the Looney Tunes, like explosion. Yeah blackness around his face or whatever. Yeah. A um, band-aid. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but also I think it's because the, the, um, the technology is improved to us to such a place where we could a- accurately like put a comic book movie into a, or a comic book story into a movie. I think the expectations for these characters to be closer to what they were in the comics is at like an all time high. Um, so I, I think that's maybe why, Back in the day, we were okay with it, and now people seem to be upset about it. Um, mm-hmm. Yeah, I think it's a lot of things. Like the first thing that comes to mind is just that we have the internet now, so there's a place for average people like us to go and and voice our opinions. And back in the day, like for all I know, all the DC fanboys were actually really upset by the by the liberties Tim Burton took, but none of them necessarily knew that all the other fanboys were upset by it. And it sort of takes a gestalt of, of people being upset um, and, and sharing that information for it to actually become known. It, but, but now like you can't read anything about the, the DC movies without reading like, Oh, everyone's outraged. And uh, what's funny is that they're still going to make a ton of money because the people who are outraged are not, a, are not a large group of people. They're just the people who, go online and post a lot well and they're still going to go see the movie too yeah like, that's the, the most hilarious part yeah um, and, and, yeah I, I think additionally to that like um the those batman movies i think people were just grateful that, that somebody was making superhero movies and they would take all kinds of garbage um just to see batman on the screen and now we've had like 47 batman movies and so many <laughs> so many other superhero movies that it's just um everyone's really picky nitpicky now that's very true. Um, <laughs> I think I don't know. I, I, we've talked about Batman a lot on this podcast, and and I, I'm I'm kind of very much okay with portraying Batman as kind of an unhinged, crazy psycho. Mm-hmm. Um, the problem with that is you're still trying to make him a hero at the same time, and that doesn't like he's not he's not supposed to be the anti-hero, or whatever. He's just supposed to be straight up good guy. So I don't know if that's going to work. I mean, obviously we're just speculating, but. I mean, yeah. in, in a world where Superman breaks people's necks, like, of course, Batman murders people. So that makes sense. Right. Yeah. At least he's consistent. That's true. <laughs> yeah. But we will find out in uh, March. Maybe. I, I forget when that movie comes out. It's soon. I don't know. It's soon. All right. Um, the next thing I want to talk about is another comic book movie, because there are 8,000 of them. But uh, Deadpool... Uh, which is a Marvel property not owned by Marvel Studios, comes out next Friday. And the marketing for this film has been absolutely incredible. Um, I love it. Uh, I, I shared yeah. some of it with you. I don't know how much I've shared with you of all the stuff that they've done, but um, it it comes out near Valentine's Day, so they, they literally put a poster up and cut a whole trailer that makes it seem like a romance uh, movie. Yeah. And then, like, they didn't, like do any of the the normal punch pulling where like at the end of the trailer they would reveal it as no actually this is a superhero movie it's just straight up a seriously cut trailer to seem like romance and they never explain the joke or anything um <laughs> yeah 
it's funny that might have been the first actual trailer that i saw for that movie but uh <laughs> of course i know who deadpool is um yeah i this is this is where i have to mention that i think i had the first deadpool that, that i had my first deadpool comic at like in like 1994 or something oh wow i didn't know um, that just just gonna i'm not even a comics person i just like one of the three comics i had happened <laughs> to be a deadpool comic so um, are, you, are you excited about this movie at all i mean y- yeah actually because it's it's mainly going to be a comedy i think yeah um and ryan reynolds is always fun when he gets to just be a crazy person which is exactly what deadpool is um and he, and he I've loves heard, this character so much yeah yeah in fact he even played the other deadpool in, in the terrible wolverine movie um, yeah but but i think he's almost doing this movie as like a do-over because he realizes how bad that was. I really think this movie's going to reference that too. As fourth wall breaky as Deadpool is, they're probably going to straight up just reference that movie. Yeah, if if our, if our listeners don't know, the whole gimmick with Deadpool is that the the superhero or whatever he is, Deadpool in the comics, is constantly breaking the fourth wall and and like is is aware that he's in a comic book and is aware that he has a Wikipedia page and all these things. <laughs> Um, and so he'll like basically give a side to the reader and it's, it's kind of, it's just kind of an original and, and refreshing little, you know, way to inject humor into fairly repetitive comic book. The only thing I don't, I don't, yeah, go ahead. the only thing I'm kind of worried about is, and the trailers of the film have made it seem like it's very excited to be a comic book movie where Deadpool gets to cuss a lot. And I'm, I'm worried that the movie is just going to be a lot of. Like, I get to say fuck humor, and yeah. I hope not. I mean, I, I feel like they they kind of know what they're doing, and I know it's tested really positively. Um, so, I don't know, but I, I think the marketing's got me excited. That trailer, the other thing that they did was, that, I, that you fell for, was the, uh-huh. <laughs> the clickbait thing where you can post oh stuff onto Facebook, and it just yeah. <laughs> tells you you've, you've gotten got. <laughs> yeah, I'm going to pull up my my Twitter so that I can share, share my favorite ones, which I, which I posted. Um, <laughs> I missed those. I didn't see you post the those. shocking, the shocking tweet, uh, this shocking tweet about muffins that will baffle devil worshipers. <laughs> 11 emojis that would trouble a Marine biologist. <laughs> and of course, these are just things where you're like, I have to know what that is. And then you click and it leads you to the Deadpool site. <laughs> It's just like seems like their marketing people are just having so much fun. Like they're just loving yeah. it. There was this I don't know if you saw the the PSA. There was a public service announcement with Deadpool in it that was all about um men checking their balls for lumps. Yeah. <laughs> and it was like it was like dead serious. Like I yeah. mean except for except for Deadpool's making inappropriate puns during out the whole thing, but like the whole thing is like actual giving you serious medical ways of of inspecting yourself. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, for tumor growth right. and it's just like it's just like they're thinking of every zany thing they can come up with and it's just working so well like it almost makes me think there's no way that this movie could live up to the wonderfulness that was the marketing <laughs> but yeah I, I don't i mean see i actually have pretty low expectations for the movie itself i just expect it to be somewhat amusing and and i'm gonna get the round ryan reynolds package um yeah so it can probably, I don't know, it might surprise me. It might surprise me one way or the other. Well, I will find out next week. Hopefully you All right. Hopefully you get to see it not not too long after that. Need to work a way out for that. Yeah, we'll see. <laughs> <laughs> we'll see what happens. All right, one of the other uh, pieces of news that came out has to do with Alien Covenant, which is the Prometheus sequel um, that's now going to be part of a trilogy that leads up to the original Alien because that's a thing that everyone needed. I think both you yeah. and I have made our opinions on Prometheus pretty blatantly known on this podcast or in the writing when I wrote mm-hmm. a, when I wrote a 10-page basic rant about how much I hated the movie. Um so the the news about this is not only that it exists and it's happening and it's a horrible idea, but apparently so they're bringing Michael Fassbender's character back um who if you recall at the end of the movie was just a robot head without a body. Um, but they are not bringing back uh, Naomi Rapisi. How do you pronounce her last name? I don't want to say it wrong. I don't know. I, I have no idea. 
Okay, well, I'm not going to try. So the other main character that was alive at the end of Prometheus is not being brought back. So how head David survives, but other human doesn't, I, I don't and know. It, it probably crashed on a prison colony, and uh, the whole movie's going to be them. Um, and David's going to have to they're get gonna, his head shaved. And, they're going to uh, alien three the whole thing. Yeah. No, I, I, I hope that does, David... Does anyone want this movie made? I, Ridley Scott. Yeah. <laughs> I don't know. I mean, the, like, there, there's no way you can explain, like, the, just making a trilogy spoiling the entire coolness that was Alien, I just, God, this is a terrible it's, idea. This is a really bad it's really, idea. It's so, like, incomprehensible to me because the, the, the whole Alien thing comes from basically comes from hp lovecraft which yeah. was this like horror writer like 100 years ago or whatever and the whole thing about hp lovecraft is that the whole like fun of it is is wrapped up in the fact that you're never going to find out what's going on or, or why these things are happening it's 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 like intrinsically unknowable and that's what's horrifying about it it's an unknowable cosmic horror and you're never going to understand it. It may even be beyond human comprehension, and that's like the root of the horror. Yeah. And if it, like if you if you explain it, you have undermined the entire. It would it would be like having a comedy and then making a prequel to the comedy that was just like somebody sitting in front of the camera explaining all the jokes <laughs> in the comedy or something. It's like it's like you've dest- you're like destroying the actual framework of your of your narrative. I don't yeah. know why you would ever do this. You're so right. Yeah. It, I mean, alien was great. Yeah. Because you had no idea what this thing was and you couldn't kill it. It was unstoppable. Like even, even at the end of that movie, when she knocks the thing out of the airlock, it's still moving around. Like yeah. there's a very distinct chance that it could still just survive in space and it's fine. Cause it's this yeah. horrible, unkillable creature. And as much as I love aliens, which I love aliens, um, it did co- that kind of damaged, the whole perception of what these things were. Um, right. But going back and explaining their origin, like that's, that's even worse. Like, and the, their origins yeah. sufficiently explained. They were <laughs> this obviously harvested thing that was used on a ship and they killed everyone aboard the ship and crash landed. And then that's all you need to know. Like, yeah. Right. And, and the mystery of like, did, 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 did you know, was it a weapon that belonged to these people that got out of hand? Or was it something that they were collecting from a scientific expedition? Um, you know, were, were were these like the young of the species? I mean, like there's there's so many more fun, more creative things that you think up wondering about the mystery than could ever actually be delivered in the form of backstory. Yep. So, so terrible, that, terrible. That news was just really an excuse for us to complain about Alien Covenant. Yes. Again, which will I, I will do. I will continue to do, and I'm going to put my foot down and say I'm not going to see this one because I don't. I don't want, want to support it. I see a lot of movies that I wish weren't made, um, but this one I'm going to put my foot down and say I'm not going to pay money for this thing. Good. I am. I am also not, but it doesn't mean as much. But I, I commend you, sir. <laughs> I'll probably end up seeing it. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Um, Let's let's move on then to our main event. Let's move on to the Cohen brothers. Um, so I want you. We, we kind of talked about this on the top, but uh, why don't you give me just your before we go into these movies? You want to talk about your overall opinion on on the Cohen brothers and uh, I guess specifically to their comedies. What uh, overall feeling you have? Sure. Yeah. I guess my first thought when it comes to their comedies is is just the really um unusual like style of humor um they're they're not like most comedies i think that's an understatement actually like you're you're not usually busting up laughing like at the same frequency that you might be laughing in um in sort of a, a standard modern comedy but like you're more marveling in and enjoying the absurdity of of things and then the laughs that do happen really really do pay off and they're and they're always really like creative um with, with kind of where they find the humor in the situation and it's just, they're, they're very absurdist um and they're just a, a very 
very unique. They're they're doing a very unique art. Um, and uh, I think that's about all I have to say as a as a general statement about them. Yeah, that's that's all really great. Um, I agree. I I think it's fun, and I got to do this exercise, you know, while, while watching these four movies and in, in preparation to talk about them. But I got to look and and think about you know their their trends in these type of films as a whole. And they they like to pick a different part of the the country or the world for each one of their their movies, um, and they kind of deconstruct what it's like living there and what the people are like there. But there's there's always these like common themes that that tie the movies together. Um, I mean, it, they're very, it's it's very dark comedy, but it's normally um, a person, um, basically a good person, but getting in over their head. With with some stupid greedy plot or something, that things just kind of uh, spiral out of control, um, and in 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 funny and dark ways, um, they love they love uh, kidnappings and ransom stories. That's yeah. the thing I, I didn't really fully realize until I watched all these in a row. That I mean, Fargo uh, has that. The big Leba- the the big Lebowski has it. Burn after reading has it. Sort of. I mean, it's not a kidnapping, but they're they're ransoming information. And now this new one that that comes out tomorrow uh, is the same thing. So they love these kidnapping stories. Um, That's but, interesting. So let's let's dive right into our first movie, which I kind of spoiled, um, is Fargo, which um, I I love this movie. I I always forget. Like I mentioned this about Coens in general, but I forget how watchable this movie is and how rewatchable this movie is. I, I hadn't seen it in a while, and I watched it earlier this week and I loved every minute of it. It's so well shot. It's so well written. It's really, really funny in their kind of classic ways. I I wonder if this is my favorite of their comedies. Yeah. I, I think that it may be my favorite, although it definitely jockeys with over there were art thou. Um I, I I I don't know how many times I've watched this movie. This is definitely one of my favorite movies, I I would say. Um I and I, I'm just gonna have to point out the fact that we're including Fargo as a comedy when most people would probably call it a drama, but um, it, it's it's just so, I think you would agree, Scott, it's just so permeated with, with the dark, dark humor. And you're not really like, again, like I said a minute ago, you're not really laughing necessarily, hardly at all in this movie, but you're more like just amused the, the entire time, um, even yeah. with horrible things. And like, I mean, the, the classic how they end the movie with like the the, the hor- horrific side of him shoving a body into a wood chipper and somehow that coming out funny. Yeah. Um, it's, yeah. It, and it's this, it's this combination of this Northwestern um, nice guy sensibility where everyone's so super nice and polite to each other and that intermixed with these terribly violent, cruel acts that are continually, um, like everyone in this movie is is friendly and nice, but is at the same time just being awful to each other. Yeah. Um, yeah. And and it's that that juxtaposition between those two things that I think makes it funny. But yeah, like you said, not in a laugh out loud funny kind of way. Just like in this is a, a joy to watch these these kind of characters. I, I like they do they do long jokes a lot. Um, like where the the like three beat over the course of the their movies. The one in this one is Steve Buscemi's character, how like everyone just describes him as funny looking and that's yeah. that's all they can really that's all they can really pinpoint. And that stuff just it's just really funny. Um I like like so it, it would be very easy for them for you to look at this movie and think that they're like making fun of these Fargo um far north like type of people that they're kind of uh backwater and and kind of stupid but i i really like that i don't i don't think that they're doing that because i think the character of marge as much as she is very much this this type of person she's also super comp competent like she's really smart and like she's a really good cop like she's basically the one that puts everything together um like even even the scene where they first go to the the murder um, the three murders on, on the side of the road and she like puts everything together like instantly where the other cop like didn't really didn't even understand what was going on. So yeah. it's like, I don't, th- I don't think, and I think it, it makes sense 
that they're not making fun of it because I think the Coens are from the the Northwest. I think that, I, I forget where exactly they're from, but I think they're from very close to this area. So um, they definitely love these people and this this lifestyle. Um, but they're also gonna to find things to to sort of make fun of about it. Um, yeah, kind of like when the South Park guys lampoon Colorado, it's sort of like from a place of love and familiarity. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, and 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 also that you you probably get a little bit lit- literary about it and point out that like maybe the characters, maybe all the Midwestern characters are actually supposed to be portrayed as being um, s- sort of just living simple lives and then the guys who come and commit all the horrific crimes are are not midwesterners there's like one of them i don't know if the character is supposed to be a foreigner but i'm pretty sure the actor is a foreigner and then steve buscemi you know doesn't have the accent at all so right um so so it's like these this outside force comes in and brings all this violence and 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 the you know the community of midwesterners is not equipped to deal with it except for Marge. I don't, I don't know. I'm, I'm, I'm making this up as I No, I along, think, I think there's I, something to that. I think it's, it's, it's very telling though, that William H. Macy's Jerry character is kind of as much as the Steve Buscemi and, um, I forget the other guy's name. Um, as much yeah. as their characters are despicable and like, um, psychos that just murder people <laughs> like, William H. Macy's character is almost portrayed as worse than all of them because yeah. he brought all this on and it's just because of his greed um, and his unhappiness in his life. Yeah, it's definitely, he, he's definitely the sea of all the evil in the, yeah. in the story and he just sort of brings in these guys. So yeah, I mean, it, it's, it's interesting. I think that's one thing you could definitely say about all their movies is that you could write tons of, of deep analysis of them because I, I think these guys definitely the Cohen brothers definitely do think in these terms like they, they try to make they're not just they're not just trying to make really entertaining stories they're trying to say something about human nature with everything they do I think yeah and it's it's usually um, like it's funny that it, it's 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 not that it's like a pessimistic view of human nature like I think they just they just understand that underneath everyone's lives there's some darker stuff going on and they like to explore that darker stuff um and they do it in entertaining and fun ways um but so what do you think i think that the weirdest scene to me on this rewatch was marge dealing with that old um high school friend of hers the creepy yeah. stalker guy right i i could i could never and i remember the first time i watched it and it, i could never really place the the point of that scene um, and what it was trying to do it within the, the movie context as a whole. Um, what do you think about that? Yeah, that one I've, I, I, I think perhaps this is my current most preferred theory is that, um, basically he, she, she doesn't suspect that he's lying to her. And he's being super duper nice, and he's just and he, but but he is coming off really weird. And then later she finds out that he he is lying to her, yeah. And it forces her to evaluate, like, oh, this guy completely hoodwinked me. Like, I'm supposed to be a cop. I'm supposed to be, I'm supposed to be aware, you know, or or paying attention to people trying to lie to me and deceive me. And this guy, you know, totally got me, and it kind of hurt hurts her feelings, and she's sad about it. And then I may I may be wrong, but. I think you can almost see like a change come over her face at some point in a later scene where she's like obviously thinking about this. And then I think she goes to see um, William H. Macy's character because like something in her brain has clicked and she has realized that something didn't add up with that guy. So it's almost just like a something to, to cause her to act in a way that she wouldn't have acted otherwise. I don't know. Yeah. That's a, that's a really good observation. I think you're probably right with that. Um, I, I like, I especially like in this movie that, that there's a couple things. I like how casually they kill off the the wife, which is like the whole trigger of all this happening was the kidnapping of this woman, and they kill her off screen, and she's just like like Bashemi's character. Or did they kill her off screen? I can't remember. Yeah, I mean the the I think the other did. the other guy just the guy kills who her. isn't Bashemi. Yeah, he, he's like gosh. 
she was making noise. Yeah. So <laughs> and it's just like very casually, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Like yeah, it's, I thought I thought that was really great. I, I think um mm-hmm. that that first of all that's funny and it's just like so how how casually this this whole trigger of the plot was just done away with. Um yeah. and I also like how nothing's really resolved really in this yeah. movie. I mean they catch the bad guys but the movie ends with with Marge and her husband just sitting in bed, you know, talking about how they think they're doing pretty good. And I think it the movie's kind of saying is there, there's something to this, this sort of lifestyle, this, um, this nor- Northwest, um, lifestyle that these people live. I think that's, that's the Cohen saying how much they love it is like these people live a pretty yeah. simple life where even in the midst of all this terribleness that she's had to witness, like she's still very positive about her life and, um, where they are like i think the movie ends with her husband getting like his painting on the three cent stamp or something and that's like their that's like the their moment of of triumph in the movie is like he pulled this thing off um yeah and the movie the movie shows them celebrating that kind of it never celebrates the fact that she solved this case like like she Mm -hmm. she she's basically being awesome the entire movie and like it, it's treated as very procedural and just part of her job. Um, yeah, yeah. She has to go shoot somebody and probably doesn't really want to talk about it. It's just yeah. like she doesn't want that to intrude on her nice, peaceful life um, of of just like honorableness. I mean, yeah. It's it's I, I for for some reason it, it reminds me of how Steve Buscemi's character basically steals like I don't I don't remember what the amount is, but he basically steals like a million dollars from the other guy, right? Because because he gets the money from the father-in-law and it's way more than, than they expect. And then he buries almost all of it. And he's going to come back for it later. And then he gets into an argument with the guy over some paltry amount of money. And then the guy kills him. Yeah. And it's like, if he just, if he just let the guy have the car, then yeah, he would have been, like, he would have been a millionaire. Yeah. yeah and, exactly. <laughs> yeah. You're absolutely right. And that's, that's definitely their, their exploring of, of greed. And yeah, like, yeah, <laughs> And I like, like, I think it, a, a lesser movie would have done that thing where they fade out on the spot where he buried the money, just emphasizing the fact that no one ever got this money. But I, I like that this movie doesn't do that. Um, it, right. It, it's not important. Like, we, yeah, we yeah. know that we we know that no one ended up with the money, um, but it doesn't matter. Yeah. Like, M- Marge wouldn't care about that. Yeah. And, and so... So, like the movie fades. Marge is the main character of the movie, so yeah, it, yeah, it would it would be it would be like yeah, it would be inappropriate. It would be an inappropriate ending for this movie. So yeah, that's, that's an interesting point. So before before we move on, um, the performances in this thing were pretty great. <laughs> the yeah. the accents obviously were emphasized, and I, they don't have that thick. They don't really talk that thickly and that that ridiculously, but it just worked really well. Everyone pulled off the accent really well. I thought. Um, they were all I, like a lot of these guys will be used by the Coens again and again throughout their career, um, mm-hmm. especially Francis McDermott. And like you understand why? Isn't he? Uh, I mean, isn't she married to one of the Coens? Yeah, I think you're right. Was yeah. she at the time though? I wonder. I think she was. I think she may have actually gotten involved with. Um, I don't know. She she was in Blood Simple in 1984, oh, yeah, yeah, which was yeah. one of their first ones. But but I mean that that's yeah. I almost feel bad for saying that because it's like a reductive. It's like she's she's in their movies because she's awesome. Um, yeah, that's that's why <laughs> that is the reason. Yeah, for sure. All right, um, let's move on to the next one, which is the, the Big Lebowski. Which <laughs> this is probably my least favorite of the four movies we're going to talk about today. And I think I think it's just because it's not even because the movie's not good. I think it's just one of those things where like this is such a quoted and like obsessed over movie that I've just kind of gotten sick of it. Yeah. Um, what, what do you think? What's your opinion on this one? Yeah, I mean it's it's weird. I've I've always had a hard time actually sitting through this movie. Um, like it has it has a few gem gem like performances and scenes um um john what's his name john something man i knew this last week goodman john goodman yes 
talked about him last week. Yeah, so like <laughs> like the, the, that whole that whole character is great. Um, that's that's almost that's almost all that that like comes to mind when I think about this movie is is his like over the top sort of bellicose, but but like all bark and no bite. Um, just just ridiculous, hilarious character. But I don't. Yeah, I don't. I, there's not a whole lot on this movie that just makes me laugh uncontrollably and. And it's it's almost like too absurd and rambling. It, the whole thing is sort of like a, a meandering drug trip, rather yeah. than rather than like a tightly plotted um, drama. You know, disguised as a comedy, disguised as a drama, which what their other movies are. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. I, so, yeah, I was thinking a lot about this one, and so I did some research, and I think nobody is more surprised at the the universal love for this movie than the Coen brothers themselves. I think they consider this a pretty minor movie in their collection. I think you mentioned that you could take a lot of these movies and break them down and analyze them. I don't really think you could do that with this movie. I think this was just meant to be like a fun, uh, weird idea they had that they wanted to do. Um, I think this the story of this movie doesn't really matter. Um, the story mm-hmm. is kind of really confusing when you pace it all out. Like, who has the money? Where's the money? What... <laughs> Was there ever yeah. any money? Like, like it's not, it, it, but it doesn't matter. It's, it's mostly just discussing these characters and, and it, it's, it, it doesn't really flow. It's just rent. It seems like a, a lot of random scenes that don't really connect with each other. Um, but I think, I think John Goodman's character is really great. I think Jeff Bridges as the dude is, is fun to watch. And I think that's kind of why this movie was so beloved. Um, I think the unsung hero of this movie is, Steve Buscemi though I think his mm-hmm. his Donnie character is the funniest one in the movie and like the only the only moment in the movie that there's actual like kind of real pathos is is his death um, yeah it's the only thing that people generally seem as upset about throughout the entire movie um, yeah to an actual he, real way right he, he does serve as a nice like punching bag for John Goodman's character he, yeah. he just has to be like t- totally downtrodden basically and then and then dies tragically yeah I, I agree but he's always like he cares like about his friends like he's always asking them questions and he wants to be involved he's just he's just kind of an idiot and yeah uh, <laughs> he it's it's it, he's like a normal person yeah whereas whereas his friends are these like extremely bizarre caricatures so yeah he's very easy to empathize with i think goodman's character is, is the most interesting one here to talk about i think because i think mm-hmm. there's a lot of people that really love this character and I'm worried that like they love him in a I want to be him kind of way (laughs) and I don't understand that reading of the character like I've seen I only bring this up because I was looking at this one guy someone I know on Facebook posted this really stupid political rant that made me angry so of course now Mm -hmm. I have to go look through his profile and his cover photo was Walter Sobchak John Goodman's character and mm-hmm. I was like, "Huh, I wonder if these two things are related." <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that that that's that's funny because I don't read the character as being intended to be emulated. Right. I mean, like, like he's whole, he's obviously an idiot. Yeah. Yeah. The whole the whole his whole arc, if you will, through the film is um, rec- realizing that he's all talk and he's actually kind of a coward and like doesn't. I don't think he even really fully understands what he's saying. <laughs> Or knows what he's doing. Yeah, yeah. He just he he goes on these rants about Vietnam and 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 then like like they throw in the thing where like his wife is walking all over him and yeah and and the dude is always telling him not to do that and then he just he gets really in you know irritated and and, and defensive about it and yeah he's Jewish because um, he converted for his wife but they're divorced <laughs> but he still yeah. is hardcore into uh, all the Jewish traditions yeah. Yeah. Like, I I don't look at this as someone we should look up to. Like this is not someone I would put as the <laughs> the cover photo on my Facebook page. <laughs> I, I, I feel like the, I feel like this character and and the dude for that matter were just like people that the Coens knew and were like, hey, let's let's write these crazy people who we know into this movie. I, I think I even read something to that effect at one point yeah. where they were like yeah this plot em- uh, this plot element or this character element came from our friend bob who wouldn't shut up about vietnam or something like that <laughs> um, yeah 
which is totally a thing you can imagine. Like you can imagine this being a real person who just like tries to connect everything to Vietnam. Um, yeah. So. So the only other yeah. thing I can think to talk about here is um, there's there's the 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 kind of bookend piece um, with and I'm blanking on his name now, which I I shouldn't because he's a very famous, well known actor. But uh, the the narrator. Yeah. What is his name? I'm gonna have to look it up because I'm old. Old guy, guy Mc Cowboy. <laughs> old awesome mustache, Mc Cowboy. Sam Elliott. Jesus. Oh yeah, that's. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, so there's like he bookends it, and then there's that part part in the middle where he's just talking to the dude, and that is again one of these moments in this movie where I didn't I didn't understand kind of what was going on and what was that that was supposed to mean. Um, I guess probably nothing like <laughs> nothing else in this movie really means much. So, um, it's probably just a fun moment. <laughs> they wanted him to interact with Sam Elliott. I don't know. Yeah. I I have no deeply insightful, um, explanation for, for this character's involvement or why there needed to be. I, I mean, I mean, so much of this movie is, it's really just not, sense i mean you could come up with a reason for it but like i'm looking at the poster and it's like his dream sequence where he's dancing around with the valkyrie um yeah or you know or the character dressed up as a valkyrie yeah, and like bowling Julianne it's Moore's like character yeah it's like it's like yeah i mean the whole that's just a ridiculous that, that's kind of why i have trouble watching this movie is if you're going to throw a dream sequence into the movie that really has you know it doesn't advance the plot and it's just a long weird dream sequence then by definition you're not too interested in like moving the plot ball forward yeah um so and that that just makes it difficult for me to pay attention to not my cup of tea i know some people love this movie yeah so. well and just like the fact that like wh- why what does bowling have to do with anything nothing like why yeah, it, right. it, it has nothing to do with the plot um it, i don't know like but again i think just like like fargo this is a movie that kind of explores the type of people that live in the LA Valley type area um, and the type of people you interact with, you've got the, the lazy Jeff Bridges kind of character. Um, you've got John Goodman's kind of crazy character. You've got the ridiculous artist <laughs> in Julianne Moore. And then you have the super rich guy and his uh, trophy wife. Um, so it's kind of, once again, exploring the type of character. I think one thing that the Coens do more than anything better than anyone is create these these characters that are different and not really like anything else you ever see on, on, on t- the movies. Yeah. Yeah, that's true. Like, like even the rich guy is actually a fake and it's like, Oh, that, that's actually novel. You know, the, yeah. the, the archetype of the, of the old, the old rich grumpy man is, is normal, but, um, or, you, you know, you've seen that before, but you haven't seen the old rich grumpy man who's, you know, extremely, um, judgmental but is actually a fraud like that that the yeah. novel twist on it you could probably write a whole think piece on how the rich the only rich one in the story is julianne moore who is a strange artist yeah and, yeah. and not really holding herself out as rich but right. the, all the rich people are just bullshitting yeah yeah so that's that's the, the big lebowski a lot of people this is their favorite cone movie a lot of people this is one of their favorite movies um, yeah. well, I, so po- post a comment about why we're wrong yeah <laughs> why is the big lebowski the best movie ever all right so let's move on i think we're just going through these chronologically um which i think is kind of a shame because oh brother we're out there might be one that i want to cover last but let's go ahead and do it now this this is a movie i think as far as their comedies go is very different from the other two movies we've talked we've talked about the other comedies they've made in general um, this is a very different kind of movie, but it's also really good. So you said mm-hmm. you said earlier on that this this one might be your favorite of their movies. Why? Yeah, um, I, I I may have watched this one more than any of the others actually, and it's it's just very well paced. You know, great characters. You love you love like every character in the movie. Every character in the movie is is perfectly performed by their actor. They're extremely sort of like iconic and have their own arc. I mean, you know, the the, the trio of guys um, and, and the wife and the 
the the guy who's running for mayor and it's it's just this extremely well well constructed and then, and then of course you're getting sort of this historical fiction aspect where it's actually throwing all this actual history at you um to a degree i don't know if most people even realize like the the governor guy was an actual guy um the guy the guy who wrote the uh uh the song about sunshine yeah it's escaping me um um and then i i even like the music like the fact that it's sort of this weird musical thing it's not really a musical musical but there's clearly songs that are not just soundtrack like the characters are singing them at times when it doesn't quite make sense in a realistic way for characters to be singing yeah um and there's no explanation to why they're so miraculously good at singing yeah right yeah especially especially the the trio of guys yeah. who 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 make the hit i have to i have to insert my anecdote because when i saw i saw Alison Krauss live um then they're the band who does a lot of the music in this uh in this movie and the guy who who actually sings that song because it's not actually George Clooney singing the yeah. song um he before he sang the song in the concert he he was telling the story of um telling his wife that he got that 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 the the Coens were going to use this song in their movie, and his wife was trying to clarify what exactly he was saying, and he was like, "Well, what I'm saying is, it's going to be it's going to be George Clooney, but it's going to be my voice coming out of his mouth." And then his wife said, "Oh, that's my dream." <laughs> oh, so that thought that was a great opener in a concert. Um, yeah, I don't know. So you, you you like this movie quite a lot, right? I do. I like it a lot. Uh, this is the one I just watched this. Um, just you know, about finished it about 20 minutes before we got on this call. Um, this is the one I kind of saved for the end because I knew I was going to like it and I wanted it most fresh because I, I, I would like to spend most of our time talking about this movie because there's so many things going on with it. Um, I love that it's, it's the Odyssey. I love that yeah. it, it's not the Odyssey in reference. I love that they just come out and say it. Um, like it, I'm looking at the IMDB page right now and, and Homer is listed as one of the writers. <laughs> that's great um, <laughs> so they just they just come out Good right out and say it it's i mean it starts with a quote from the beginning quote from the odyssey i think and i think that allows you like as you're wa- going along watching the movie you recognize the characters that are supposed to be representative of um the, the characters in in the poem and um, i think that's great like uh, john goodman's character it, it has one eye <laughs> Yeah, um, and then the sirens, which they, which they put out with the fiery brand. Yeah, <laughs> and then um, yeah, which is a burning cross. It's not, not really yeah. a fiery brand. It yeah, counts. Well, it counts. Um, yeah, it counts. Yeah, but I think it. The performances, like you say, are great. Like Goofy George Clooney is like my favorite George Clooney. I think he's so oh, good at it. Um, and he, like he's his character in this movie is so great. Like every his his minor ticks, like the fact that he has hairnets and he loves the the specific brand of of hair oil um like just everything like he he just kind of they it's three guys just kind of bumbling through this this movie not really knowing what's going on um and strange things keep happening but everything keeps working out for them i love that they get on the stage at the end to perform this this hit song that they don't even know is a hit song. Like people yeah. just start reacting positively to it and they're like, Oh, okay. Um, the music, like, as you said, it is so good. I think that the racial stuff is really interesting. Um, yeah. and that's what I want. I want to spend a lot of time on because this is a movie that it takes place in 1930s, Mississippi. Um, there's Ku Klux Klan members in it, but it, it it's, the, the three main characters are never there's never anything racist in their in them at all like they i don't think they ever say anything bad like they they hang out with the, the the black guy with the guitar for yeah. a lot of the movie yeah. who's, um, who's actually supposed to be another historical figure which is great oh really i didn't know that That's yeah it's, cool. it's it's tommy johnson who i believe is maybe i'm getting things confused here but i think he he either is or he's based off um um yeah well i don't want to do realize but, but but yeah I, I agree i mean they even they end up breaking into a clan rally to to save a, a black man so yeah and and there's the whole part at the end where the the 
it's interesting that like the the seen as progressive guy running for governor turns out to be the one that's uh the closeted racist and kkk guy and he gets outed um by the the church guy who's the current standing governor who's seen as the traditional um guy and that the fact that like no one no one cares like they they try to <laughs> talk about how these guys aren't white um that that guy up there is is a black guy and like no one cares cuz they just love the music so much like that's all really powerful i think um i just like i, I love how the movie like sets it within a, a very racist area and in a ra- very racist time and like it, it it it's there's not any like challenge to it like none of like there's not any conflict really that has to do specifically with with racism um it's just it's it's prevalent but our characters don't really care about it um cuz they just don't see it mm-hmm. I, I just really like that I, I thought that was really well done and i liked i didn't notice this before i noticed it this time though the the chain gang at the beginning um we never see them with the chain gang but they're all black the the the, the group that they're with they're all black except for them that's interesting so, yeah, I never noticed that either. Yeah, yeah. So, so sorry, I'm I'm trying to determine. So there, what there was actually a a, a um, Delta blues musician named Tommy Johnson who lived during that time period, and then there's also Robert Johnson who was like an incredibly influential blues uh, guitarist who they may have been basing the character off of. But anyway, I thought I thought I had read that they, that this character was originated in actual history which would make sense because i think there was a legend that robert johnson sold his soul to the devil for <laughs> guitar playing skills um, I, I love that's that's really cool i like that a lot i like um the baby face character too yeah <laughs> who is obviously based off of i forget the actual guy's real name but baby face nelson nelson yeah baby yeah. face nelson um I love that. That's just like he's this random character that comes in. They rob banks with, and then he leaves because he's depressed. Yeah, <laughs> the, the thrill right. is he's, over. He's, <laughs> yeah, he's manic depressive bank robber, and yeah, yeah, yeah. Babyface Nelson, actual, actual guy. Yeah, you know? yeah. So yeah, I think you're right. It's it's this movie. It's this ridiculous story based on an epic poem that's steeped in the history of the, of the time, and it's just it's so well done. I thought uh, we haven't talked about them as their skills as directors very much so far. Um, but this movie is, is really well done um, from a directorial standpoint. The, some of the mm-hmm. shots are just so incredibly constructed. I think this is one of the first movies that used um, digital color correction mm-hmm. um, to kind of give it like a sepia type tone to it, um, yeah. which I think works really well. The movie has a very distinct look to it um, that I think makes it even better. I agree. That's definitely one of the more striking things about it is you, you really feel like you're seeing into the past and yeah. you know, like half of that I would guess is just the fact that they get all the details right. Um, and then the other half is, is the interesting kind of color shifts that makes it not quite, um, not quite our world. It's kind of, kind of like the matrix where yeah. it's all green. <laughs> so the other thing uh, there's a lot of, of religious stuff in this. Um, but I'm not even sure. Like, so we have our, we have two of our three main characters, like think they're absolved from their sins, um, because they get baptized and George Clooney's kind of the holdout. Um, and then uh, until the very end where he's about to die and drops out on his knees and, um, is saved by the, the water flooding. And he, I guess he gets literally, baptized by the floods of, of them damming the the area. But mm-hmm. then he kind of pops up again and is already kind of explaining it away. Yeah. Um, until he sees the cow on the roof. But he's still Which, kind of, he's, yeah. he's still kind of explaining it away. So like it, the movie has like a religious tone to it, sort of. Um, and I don't know, I don't know what the Cohen's religion is. Um, I, I wonder, I should have looked that up before we started, but, um, I thought it was interesting. It was an interesting take on, on like it, it, it both has um, a kind of guy learning to maybe trust in faith and religion, but also 
people casually talking about a guy who sold his soul <laughs> to yeah. the devil for guitar playing skills. Yeah, and then the actual level is implied to be chasing them. Um, yeah, yeah. I mean, I think it's it's implied that the guy with the the glasses is the devil. Well, yeah, because of the way um, the way Tommy Johnson describes what he looks like. Yeah, um, he's he, he's a white man like you with with black eyes, and that mm-hmm. that one guy is wearing sunglasses or or whatever goggles throughout yeah, the entire movie. Right. Yeah, yeah. Um, really, really good movie. Yeah, I I, yeah, the, I I was surprised how much I liked this. Um, I remember liking it, but not this much. It had been it had been a while since I've seen this one. Yeah, I I, I also just I don't remember. I I've had the soundtrack, or I used to have the soundtrack, and I used to listen to it like in my car or, or whatever. Um, because it's got so many like really great, you know, just great songs and great recordings of great songs. They have they have a very sharp ear when it comes to music i think the cohen's um that's one of the reasons i love inside lewin davis so much um the music in that is just phenomenal too and i need to i need to get you to watch that because <laughs> it's so good yeah definitely because because you could have made this movie without the songs like yeah. it probably would have still been good too but the but song, they were like no let's cram in all these songs and that just made it so much better yeah like the songs like there's no reason you have to tell a story of like the Odyssey with a random part where they record an album and get popular because of it. Like that's not necessary right. to the story at all. But yeah, I mean, yeah, his daughters don't have to be like the members of a child band of, yeah, of yeah. singers who just walk around singing songs that you hear in the background and and close the movie with. Yeah, really so. great, really great. Uh, do you have any any? Parting words on Oh Brother, Where Art Thou before we move on. Do you know what that's a, a reference to? The, no, the title? Um, do you? Yes. It is. Um, there was a 1930s or 40s movie. No, I think it was 30s called um, Sullivan's Travels. It's a movie about a rich director um, deciding he wants to make a movie about poor people during the Depression. So he like pretends to be a uh, homeless poor person, and then the name of the movie he wants to make in that is "Oh Brother, Where Art Thou." So that's what it's referencing. Now I don't know what that means um, in the context of the the film. <laughs> yeah, I was like, huh, I completely failed to enlighten me. But yeah, then that's that's interesting. I don't have to think about after that. Which that's a really good that. movie too. That that was on. I think it was on my AFI top one hundred list, which is why I saw it. Um, it's really good. It's funny. It's one of those classic okay. Hollywood comedies. Okay. All right, so let's move on to Burn After Reading. Um, what do you think about this one? This is a. This is I think more in line with with Fargo and and Big Lebowski as far as their typical comedy type movies. Yeah, I think I may have only seen this once, and that was in the theater a million years ago. Um, and I, and I did like it, but I I would bounce the question back on you because you, I'm betting have have seen it more recently. And so so, what do you think about this one? Yeah, I I like it a lot. I think I mean, I think Far, both Fargo and and Oh Brother are, are better movies than this. But I think once again, this is the Coen Brothers going to a, a particular uh, part of our country and kind of telling stories about the characters within it. Um, I I know some people that live in DC and their description of some of the people that live in there, like is George Clooney's character kind of to a T these people that think they're amazing. Um, and, and also think they're professional runners. Like I, I love the recurring, I got, I think I can get a run in reference uh, that Clooney <laughs> where he's just constantly like, wanting to get a run in and like being very hardcore with how far he has to go. And, um, that's, that's very much a Washington DC thing. And I think all these characters kind of are, um, there's like the, the aging CIA people, like how casually the government officials talk about all these deaths and the ridiculous stuff that keeps happening. I, I like that this movie, like, like with Fargo, it's like a slow ramp up to chaos. Like it starts off like, <laughs> I just, I just the 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 concept of it is so hilarious that like these 
stupid um, gym membership people or gym owners and or uh, exercise trainers. There's the word I was looking for. Um, are find this this disc with a uh, some retired CIA guy's memoir in it, and they're trying to extort him for money, and then they try to extort the Russians for money, and then it just spirals into this ridiculous thing where Brad Pitt's character gets sh- shot in the head. Um, yeah, which I think only the Coens could make that scene as funny as it is. Like it's character getting shot point blank in the head. Yeah. And it's hilarious. Just like the look on Brad Pitt's face right before he gets shot. Like <laughs> it it's in it it's so shocking because like you think like he's hiding in a closet and you think he's just gonna like like just gonna get discovered and then it'll be this funny scene and then it's just like <laughs> George Clooney shoots him and then freaks out and like runs away. Yeah. <laughs> and it's just it's so great. Uh, yeah. like all these all these that god, the performances in this were so good. Um, once again, Frances McDermott, like her character in this, she's really relatable. Like she's this aging fitness person who just wants these surgeries because she's trying to reinvent herself, um, because she, she's lonely and she wants to find someone. And she's got this coworker at the gym who like is in love with her and she just can't see it. And this guy does everything for her and he ends up getting killed because of it. Um, I think it's probably one of the darker of their movies because like, half people die like nothing is resolved at all like the movie ends on a joke about like what did we learn from all this well fuck if i know (laughs) yeah like like it's just like it's very much just this random cyclone of of kind of greed and and violence and ridiculousness and no one seems to care right so so there's this game that um it's like a I don't know even what the word would be for it like like a role playing game but but um just basically played verbally it's called fiasco michael grubb our frequent guest uh was the one who introduced me to to it and it's it's basically like advertises itself as like you are going to write a Coen brothers movie of the course of this game <laughs> because all all it really does is it starts out each player with like some basic brush strokes of their identity and like what they want and, and what, and like some secret about them or something like that. And then like the game just propagates forward with people trying to like move around each other. And of course, like people end up murdering each other and stuff. And it's the reason I bring this up is that um, this movie just sort of really emphasizes that I think this is how they write their movies. Basically like they start with, the, they start with a few characters who have like something they really want or or some secret or or they've done something bad or or they they're going to have to do something bad in order to get what they want. But it's not just one character, it's like two or three different characters with different agendas and then you put them all in the same pot and you just sort of see what happens and and like you said the 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 crazier things you can get to happen like Brad Pitt hiding in a closet and then the other guys sneaking around with a gun and just accidentally shoots him in the face. Um it's it's that's like 80% of their movies actually is just sort of these screw ups um, made by people who weren't quite intending for things to go as badly as they ended up going. Um, yeah, you're, you're absolutely right. And I think the cool part is they do that, but they construct on the top of it in this movie, some like looming, looming threat that like makes it seem like there's something more serious going on here. Like there's, uh, George Clooney is like being followed the entire movie and like he's also constructing some weird thing in his basement. Um talk about the the long the long joke with the the amazing reveal was <laughs> what he was constructing in his basement. Do you think it's something yeah. ominous and dangerous and the music they play over it while he's like <laughs> welding things together and then it just turns out to be this the sex chair that he's made for his wife. <laughs> yeah. I mean that's that's amazing. Like there's there's really nothing happening in this movie, but it, it makes it seem like there's all this ominous stuff happening. Um, it's just it's just a, a couple couples being miserable and wanting to get apart from each other, and then this woman just wanting to better herself, and that's really all that's happening. Yeah, I, I think I need to watch this one again just because I don't know. I feel like I owe it to the Coens. It's it's on so HBO great. right now. Um, oh. If you have HBO or if you don't have HBO, you can have my login and 
I guess we shouldn't say that on the podcast. <laughs> yeah, um, just... Matt, you can't you can't use my login. That is, you can pay that for was a HBO joke. yourself. Yeah, that was a good joke. <laughs> don't don't worry, uh, we'll we'll edit it out. Yeah, all right. Probably not. Um, I, I, it doesn't matter because I have HBO. So oh, perfect. So so there was no need for you to commit a crime just then. <laughs> well, good because I didn't. Um, yeah, no, I think I think you should take some time to to check this one out again. Um, now, now the question is, what is this movie saying? Um, <laughs> I don't know. I think it's it's it has a very pessimistic outlook of the people that live in D.C. and these people that like are kind of career government employees um, and how that like degrades and kind of destroys their lives. I think one of the most depressing scenes is like this um, government party where this one character just says like three times, I think during the course of the scene, yeah, well I work in state and like, he's bragging about it. <laughs> and mm-hmm. It's just, it's like this, like they, the, the way they film this entire party scene, like you just, I would want to kill myself if I had to sit through more than one of these parties. Mm-hmm. And, I think that's just them constructing what life is like for these career politicians and people that, um, or at least participate in the, the working government process. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I, I, that make, that makes me want to see it again because I don't remember those, that, that level of detail. Yeah, you should. Um, well, I think, so that's, that's the four movies that we picked. Um, like I said, there's there's movies we left out. There's comedies we left out. Um, I think Raising Arizona is a big one that people are probably going to be mad at us about. Um, but we didn't have time yeah. for everything, guys. And I've only seen that movie once, and it was a long time ago. <laughs> yeah, and and I I do like that movie. I just again, it was a long time ago, like like Scott. So yeah, and the problem it, with it that is that my my girlfriend hates um, Nick Cage, so I wouldn't have been able to watch that with her. Well, now we're going to have to have a podcast about Nick Cage. Nick Cage is a national treasure. Yes, he is. Do you see what I did there? Because that's a movie I, that he's I, in. I actually didn't get it until you explained it, which well, is embarrassing. That makes it even funnier, because explaining yeah. jokes makes them funnier. That's true. <laughs> Do you know they're filming a National Treasure 3? That's the news no. we should have talked about. Yeah, it's in filming right now. I don't know how that got by me. Matt, there are so many National Treasures that you don't even know about. <laughs> Uh, all right um so, <laughs> so that's 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 our cohen comedy podcast um hail caesar comes out tomorrow and i'm gonna see that and we'll definitely write a review for it to kind of wrap together all this this talk we've had um I, I, i'm glad i got to watch all these movies because i'm gonna now be paying attention to some typical cohen things in this next movie um, it looks like there's gonna be a bunch of crazy ridiculous characters and it's gonna be a lot of fun uh, a lot of good actors once again, so I'm really excited about it. Um, but we'll we will let you know how that goes, and maybe maybe I'll talk about it briefly on the podcast next week, but without spoilers. Yeah. All right. All right. So, do you have some recommendations? Scott? Yeah. Before we go, we want to just do some. Uh, we've kind of rearranged how we do this now. We're going to do recommendations at the end, so we we finish the podcast with those recommendations fresh in your mind loyal listeners so you can go out and watch those movies right away except not if you're driving because that's dangerous um so i do i do have recommendations that was a little bit of a tangent um one of the things i wanted to recommend is something that i touched briefly on last week it's a movie called anomalisa um this is a stop motion animated puppet film by uh charlie kaufman who uh i don't know if you if you saw Being John Malkovich or Adaptation, um, the, uh, there's another one of his films that I'm blanking on right now. But yeah, he's he's a really good writer. Um, Adaptation is one of my favorite movies ever. Um, and this, Anomalisa, is great. It, it's a movie about puppets, but it's like a really human movie exploring like what it means to be alive and like searching for your, your meaning in life and kind of getting out of a rut. Um, it's super depressing like all charlie kaufman movies are um but it's it's really good um it's nominated for academy the academy award for uh animated picture it's probably gonna lose to inside out but i'd i'd 
I'd be okay with either of these winning because those are both really good movies. Um, but I think it's just going to lose because I think the Academy still looks at animated movie as like the kids movie category. So they're going to vote for the, the Pixar one. But yeah, that is playing in theaters right now. Uh, limited release, I think probably so probably not in your AMCs or Cinemarks, but your art, more art housey theaters. You can find it there. Really good. Cool. I have another and- recommendation. Because Matt doesn't have one, unless Matt, you thought of one in the no. hour we've been talking. <laughs> but I, w- I was, I did just look up Charlie Kaufman and see that he also wrote Eternal Sunshine and the Spotless Mind and Synecdoche, New York, which I haven't seen. Oh yeah, um, that's Schenectady was what I was thinking about. Um, I completely forgot he wrote Eternal Sunshine. Yeah, me too. I, I love I that movie. Don't know if I ever knew. Yeah, it's one of my. I just say this a lot, but that's one of my favorite movies. Um, apparently, <laughs> he also wrote an episode of Moral Oral. I don't Which, even know what that is. Oh, that's that's a wonderful puppet um, TV comedy. This it's extremely funny and depressing. He likes puppets. I mean, puppets yeah. were in being John Malkovich, and and now he wrote a whole puppet movie. Yeah. Um, which is like it's, a lot of times, like you think that the the puppet, like at the beginning, it's like the puppet thing might just be a gimmick, but it becomes very clear throughout the movie, like why he did it this way. And I don't think you could have told the story um, without having it be puppets. I think it's it's okay. really great, I, and I can't. I don't want to say more than that without spoiling it. But okay. it's really good. And since you don't have something to recommend, I'm going to get to recommend another thing. Um, the thing I wanted to recommend is a show called Supergirl. Uh, it is on. I'm blanking on the network now. I think it's. it's CBS, NBC. It's one of the main <laughs> networks. Google it. Um, uh, Google. Um, but it, it's uh, the thing about the the DC universe is I, I haven't been a real big fan of their movie ventures, but their TV shows have been great. Um, the Flash is on CW right now. So is Arrow, which I'm not as big fan of Arrow, but I, I love the, the Flash is great um and supergirl is kind of in that same vein it's it's a very like uh like bright and and sunshiny kind of show um it's definitely more geared toward girls uh which is i think is fine because it's i think there needs to be more superhero tv shows geared toward women um but it's just it's so fun i think it, it understands the character of superman better than the movies do um and I don't think it's like intentionally setting out to do that. Like, I don't think it's, it's like trying to say, this is how, this is the correct way to do Superman. I think it's just, just telling its stories and in the process, just doing a really great job. Like I love every episode and I think people need to take some time to at least give it a shot. Um, the, the only, sometimes the dialogue is not great. Um, they're, they're not always good. There's some pretty corny dialogue in there at times, but um, it's just it's a show with a lot of heart, and I love the, every episode. It kind of starts with um, Supergirl just like doing some random uh, superhero work, just saving like pulling someone out of a burning building, or like stopping a car crash, or like rescuing people from a flood. Like just taking the time to show her just like doing normal superhero work um, instead of fighting these big bad people. Um, also, she takes the time to make sure a plane lands, lands safely in the first episode, where as a Clark Kent and Man of Steel probably would have just thrown the plane at a building or something. Yeah, <laughs> but that's Supergirl. I, I, I it sounds it sounds fun. Um, I feel like watching all these TV shows that I should be watching would be a full time job. Um, but uh, yeah, God, I have I have so much TV right now, and I'm so far behind on it. But that this is one I definitely make sure I don't miss. Okay, well that that counts. So I will try to watch the pilot at some point. How would you stream? It's, it is CBS, so is that um, is that stream anywhere, or is that just? I know CBS GFTs? like streams recent episodes. I don't know if you'll be able to watch the pilot anymore. Um, they, they that's... might have the pilot for free, but okay. I, I'm not sure how that works because I've been watching it. 
because I'm in the same problem now where I didn't start watching The Flash, which is a CW show, not CBS, but it's done by the same producers, I think. Um, I didn't start watching that till earlier this year, so I watched the first season on Netflix, um, and then the second season's currently playing, but I missed the first few episodes, and now I just kinda, I'm just i kind of stuck. I don't know what to do, um, so I'm behind on it. But It's so funny, because I, I now expect all TV shows to just be streamable. Like, <laughs> yeah. Well, I'm sure like you could drop money. Like you could on iTunes, you could probably s- subscribe to the season or just drop like four bucks for whatever episodes. I'm pretty sure you can do that, but yeah. Cool. All right. So next week on the podcast is our first episode of our new book for our book club so we're going to be talking about the first half of fates and furies by lauren groff um matt how's the how's your reading on that going oh yeah um i like the first um part of the (laughs) book where uh the characters are introduced (laughs) and the setting oh that's Um, uh you're so far uh, you're way further along than i was because i haven't even started it yet so oh good good for you you should be ashamed of yourself scott (laughs) um you could totally yeah i still haven't bought it (laughs) you haven't bought it yet (laughs) oh wow i'm gonna i'm gonna get it on my phone and just do my (laughs) So next week, we are going to have miraculously read the first 200 pages of that book, and we are going to talk about it on this podcast, probably with our book club guest, Cindy Daly, although I haven't actually asked her yet. We're really organized here. Yeah, it's <laughs> going to be really deep, deep analysis, because there's plenty of time to read 200 pages and think about it really hard. Matt, we're really smart. We always do really deep analysis. It's, it's... That's true. <laughs> That's true. But that will be next week on the podcast. Um, and then coming in a, in a few weeks is going to be our Oscar coverage because that's, that's going to be ramping up soon. So lo- lots of fun things to look forward to, but, um, that's all for this week. Matt, where are you on the internet? I'm on Twitter at more than a meal. And... <laughs> Did you intentionally say that really fast? Yes. <laughs> and dailyplanetfilms.com as as a writer. Um, and I think that's about it. How about you, Scott? I'm also on Twitter uh, at Scott daily 85. I forgot my Twitter handle there for a second. That was not good. That's D a L Y. Um, our website, Twitter is also daily planet films. And I too am at daily planet And uh, you can, if you're listening to this, podcast on the website you can subscribe to itunes to android to youtube um and i think that's it right i think that's all we, we exist on yeah and well you can also just access the mp3 directly from the website if yeah. you if you use like unix or something um <laughs> so many people use unix yeah all right, <laughs> <laughs> all right. uh well, Matt, thanks for talking Cohen's with me again. This was really good. Um, I can't wait to see how good Hail Caesar is. Hopefully I'll see it tomorrow. Um, I'm sure I'll text you about that, and we'll let everyone on the internet know as well. Um, but uh, we will see you next week. Pod-